Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you so much for tuning in to a, another episode today. If you are new, this is a place where I talk about my health journey and everything to do with that, whether it is nutrition or wellness or biohacking or healthy habits, lifestyle, everything like that. And so I am happy to bring a episode to you that is obviously in line with that. And today we are going deep into the world of biohacking <laughs> with the biohacker babes. This was such a fun podcast. Honestly, it was so long overdue. I think I've said this many times, but there's not a lot of females, leading females, let's say, in the biohacking space. And so we all kind of know who each other are. And I finally got to sit down with Lauren and Renee and record this podcast episode. And it was so much fun. And it was honestly just great to go back and forth and talk about good biohacks and bad ones that haven't really worked and people we know in the industry and brands. And it was just a lot of fun. And it was really easy and really casual. And they're both great women. So if you don't follow them and subscribe to them, please do. Their podcast is called The Biohacker Babes. Great. Lots and lots of content there. They are on social media as well. And I will link everything for them in the show notes and on my website as well. A shout out to Nochi, which is my new favorite menstrual health supplement. So I talk a lot about cycle syncing and your menstrual cycle. And, you know, I have an online guide that helps women kind of understand that it's a digital product. You can buy it on my website and it's all about cycle syncing. And one of the things that I actually talk about in that guide is the different herbs that you can use throughout your menstrual cycle and how they can support you and how they can actually reduce some of the symptoms that you're dealing with. So there is a lot of research behind this. There's a lot of research behind tradi traditional Chinese medicine and how it can be very helpful for us. And that's what this company has done. So they've actually made it super easy for all of us to be able to benefit from traditional Chinese medicine in a supplement rather than taking the herbs or trying to have tea every day of it or dried herbs or anything like that. It's all in one supplement. So this one is my favorite. It's called no, or New Moon, and it's by No Chi, which I said earlier. They are linked on my website and in the show notes, and I use their menstrual support supplement every single day. It has ginger in it, jujube, jube, cinnamon, rose, and ginseng, which are also adaptogens. So we love that. Definitely check them out. My discount code with them is Brittany in all capitals. A shout out to Bioptimizers, one of my favorite long-term supplement companies. This one is my go-to for magnesium. I've actually been taking it at night. So I take my magnesium every single day. It's part of my daily supplement stack for sure. And it probably has been for a few years now, but I've actually moved to only taking it at night. So I was taking one a day for a while, but now I kind of want that extra sleep support. So I've changed to two at night, about an hour before I, I go to bed. And this has really helped with helping me get into my parasympathetic state, very relaxed, less go, 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 and just kind of helps with like the evening wind down. So if you're somebody who struggles to fall asleep, if you're somebody who wakes up throughout the night, if you are maybe, you know, a new mom or a new parent and you just need some like support when you're trying to sleep, this is the product for you. They also have magnesium powders now, which is really cool. So I don't take the powders. I would, and I've tried them before, but I just have the supplement with me. I think it's easier. So I just take that and I recommend it to everyone. And last but not least, Inside Tracker. Let me tell you, they came to my house last week and I got tested. I think they took like seven vials of blood. Now, it was great because I think it is very valuable to get a lot tested at once. You might as well kind of do it in one, in one shot is my opinion. And so they did my hormones, my minerals, my vitamins. I am waiting for that information to come back. And I will 
100% update you on what that says. So Inside Tracker is great because they are able to come to your house and you don't have to go anywhere. Even if you're in Canada, like I am, they will come to your house. It's private. You don't need a prescription. You pay for it yourself and you get everything tested. So I really recommend it. My discount code for them is Biohacking Brittany in all capitals. Same with Bioptimizers. It's Biohacking Brittany. And it's all linked on my website and in the show notes. Definitely check it out if you are wanting to optimize your health and really take everything to the next level. So enjoy this podcast episode with the Biohacker Babes. It was such a delight speaking to them. They are both so sweet and so kind. And I feel like I just have a lot to learn from them. So enjoy this and stay tuned for another episode coming later on this week. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am so excited that you are listening this week for another episode. Today is really special. I am bringing on the Biohacker Babes, who I actually got to meet in person at the Biohacking Conference in June in Florida. And they are Lauren Sambataro and Renee Bells. And actually, I guess we should talk about this. I didn't even know you guys were sisters until I actually did some digging into your backgrounds and realized that you are sisters and you just have different last names. But I guess that makes sense ah. because <laughs> like of your relationship and how close you guys are. And I, I don't know, I just never put two and two together, but long way to say, <laughs> welcome to the show. I'm so excited you're here. Oh, thank you thank so much you. for having us. And you are not alone. A lot of people have no idea that we're sisters or I say they think that we're twins. There seems to be uh, they're like, you're definitely yeah. twins. Or wait, what? Yeah. Oh, we're yeah. The, mari- <laughs> the married name, I think, confuses people a lot, which yeah. is under- understandable. Yeah. yeah. No, it really does. But I guess like, I, yeah, I just never looked further into it. Honestly, I just thought you were like best friends who like started this thing together. And I thought it was really cool. Which oh, is also uh, kind of true. <laughs> yeah, that's that true is too. Also true. <laughs> <laughs> We're very yeah. fortunate. Yeah. So Renee is a certified nutritional consultant and holistic lifestyle coach with a master's degree in nutrition. And Lauren is a Broadway performer, corrective exercise specialist, and functional health coach. I love the different backgrounds you both have. And then I was also reading about your childhood and how you kind of grow up, you grew up in this family that was pretty health conscious. So is that kind of like the starting point that got you into biohacking in the first place? Definitely. We always give credit to our dad. We call him the OG biohacker. You know, sorry, Dave Asprey, but we think our dad was doing it first. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So he's a biological dentist. He wasn't always practicing biological dentistry, but has been a dentist for over 40 years and just always had a very curious perspective and mindset. And so he had a lot of different cool technologies that we call biohacking devices. Now he had them in our living room. So we were exposed to these it's very young children. And we always joke that we, you know, didn't really understand what they were. We were playing with them. Our friends would come over. And now as adults, we're like, wow, our dad has some really cool stuff. Wow. So we were exposed to tech very early on, but we also were just exposed to his curiosity with, which I think has been a really like driving force and guiding principle through our lives to really step into our own and become our own best health gurus. And now, you know, we call that biohacking. So I love thanks that. to dad. Yeah. Yeah. What was some of the tech that you had that you were like exposed to very early on? We had an infrared sauna. We had a vibration plate, a low level laser, which, you know, now people call more like red light therapy, but, and also like homeopathic remedies. A lot of like vitamins are on the house and, I even remember just witnessing our dad kind of biohacking his diet. Like back in the early 90s, he would do like fruitarian for a little bit. He would do water fasting. He would do juice fasting, you know, soy, all the things that were kind of like hip in the 90s. But we would watch him kind of experiment and see how he would feel maybe better or worse. So I think that also kind of like laid the groundwork for us to be open-minded to experimenting and doing like those N of one experiments with, you know, nutrition, exercise, all the things. Yeah. That's wild that you were exposed to that at such a young age before it was even remotely popular as it is now. Like I just yeah. could not imagine having like a casual vibration plate in my house. 
like, I know it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. We actually, I, we were both ballet dancers and, you know, so growing up we had injuries ever so often and our dad would be like, okay, put this laser on here, put this cream, put, you take this homeopathic remedy, all the things. And I don't think we really knew what was going on, but definitely it was helpful to have. Yeah. At the very least, I think it just widened our perspective and our understanding of conventional medicine versus alternative holistic therapies. It, it, we very quickly learned that there were other opportunities. And we love conventional medicine. There's a lot of benefit there. But it, we realized that there are a lot of things on the table. And given the situation, we can kind of pull from different toolboxes, which is just, we're so grateful. I mean, it wasn't all easy going. We had our own health challenges. And we had to kind of take a few different routes to get where we are today. But I do think that early exposure at least helped get us to where we are now. Yeah, for sure. Like, I feel like it probably just opened your perspective, like you said, to different healing modalities at such a young age versus a lot of people get there maybe later on in life. So what was kind of like that transition of you saw this tech growing up, but then like, how did you get to the word biohacking? Like, where did that kind of come into the story? Ooh, that's a good question, Renee. Do you know when we first said the word biohacking? <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. And it's possible that it was around the time of Dave Asprey and even Ben Greenfield. Like maybe that's where it came in. But I think our we were exposed actually to like biological medicine before maybe the word biohacking, which again came from our dad. I can tell a quick story about how he even got into this because I think this is so fascinating. So in 1985, he was still practicing traditional dentistry, which is placing mercury amalgam fillings, using fluoride, root canals, all the traditional dentistry things. And his best friend at the time got diagnosed with stage four melanoma and was given three to six months to live. They said, we can't even treat the cancer. And this tough guy said, kind of screw you to traditional medicine, flew out to California from New Jersey at the time and went to this holistic clinic. And they said, before we can treat your cancer, you have to have all the metal removed from your mouth. And he's like, well, what in the world does that have to do with my cancer? Flies home, tells our dad. And even he says, what is the connection? I've never heard of these fillings being a problem. But that sparked his curiosity to say, there might be something here. And then he went down the whole rabbit hole of discovering the problem with mercury and the silver fillings and continued on studying biological medicine, also what we know as biological dentistry. So just that curiosity back in the 80s also taught us like, oh, there could be something else out there. But anyways, that was a long answer to say of maybe the biohacking came from the biological medicine set inside. But oh, and also his friend is still alive today. I always have to like share that part. He's alive and doing amazingly well. Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah, that's just so, oh, that's so interesting. And also just like so inspiring, to be honest. But that makes sense. Like, I think a lot of people kind of first actually hear the word biohacking from people like Dave or Ben. And that like obviously makes a lot of sense because they're just like such a big face in the space. But how do you kind of define biohacking to people who maybe have never heard the word before? Oh gosh, I love this question so much. <laughs> I think there's so many different yeah. ways that we could answer it. And my answer personally changes depending on what's kind of in my current environment and my mind. But I think that biohacking is a curiosity and using tools and modalities to upgrade our genetic potential, which I think is a common definition or explanation. But it's the curiosity and the willingness. And I think a healthy dose of skepticism that helps us to really get feedback from our own bodies so we can determine what is right for us with the understanding that there is no one size fits all. So I think it's more like the questioning and the learning and the approach more so than the technology, which is awesome. But I think we have all the tools within ourselves, and that's really kind of the, like the starting point for me for biohacking. Yeah, I agree with that. Like my definition is like, somewhat similar to that, but it kind of changes just like yours, like depends on the day type of thing. But I don't know, like I, I also see a lot of people are skeptical about the word biohacking. And I don't know, I, I guess it depends on the circles that you run in, but I do have people who reach out to me. And like, when we talk about this, they kind of are, they don't like the word because they kind of feel like it's saying, oh, let's hack ourselves 
and do this quick hack and it's going to fix everything. And there's kind of this like negative connotation to it. So like, how do you feel about that when people talk to you or like, what is your typical, I guess, response to that type of criticism? Yeah, I think we can't let the terminology get on in our way because I think our intentions are all pretty much aligned. I think I do think about this a lot because my greatest mentor in life, who is Paul Check, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Check, but started the Check Institute Institute. It's been a huge part of our education. He hates the word biohacking for that reason. It sounds like you're hacking your biology, and he believes we should call it bioharmonizing. To me, I think we're doing the same thing regardless. It's not taking no for an answer. It's not jumping to the quickest solution. It's having that curious mindset and continuing to look and to dig and looking for root causes and putting the puzzle pieces together. I think we can call it whatever you feel comfortable calling it. But if we're really trying to get to the root cause and figure out what is right for our physiology, I think that's, you know, that is bioharmonizing, that is pro-life, that is supportive of health and genetic potential. So I don't know, the term definitely can get in the way, but it doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I've gone back and forth about it. I've gone back and forth about rebranding and getting rid of the word biohacking. And just because like, I'm just so into holistic health and women's health in general, that biohacking is like one aspect of that. And like, how does that yeah. How does that come off to other people, I guess, and branding and all those different thoughts and whatnot. But at the end of the day, yeah. like We've been talking about that a lot. (laughs) Yeah. We actually were like joking. We, you know, kind of like you with biohacking with Brittany, like the biohacker babes, like the BB, it's kind (laughs) of just like flowed. So we were kind of jokingly, we're like, we could be the health span hotties or the longevity ladies. (laughs) 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 Just like hilarious names. But yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah, it's all optimizing health. That's all it is. So yeah, it is. That is so funny. The health span hotties. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> it could be Maybe a whole team of us female biohackers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. It's tough because I like I love biohacking so much and I really do. I don't think I'll ever not like it. I don't think I'll ever not be like excited about like new products and tech and like how this can optimize my health. But it's just like you, like I started biohacking Brittany years ago and I love the alliteration and all of my social handles and podcasts and website, everything is biohacking Brittany. And I actually come up when you search on Google now. And so now I'm like, okay, if I switch everything, it's like, oh, is it it worth it? Like, Oh gosh, I understand your plight. I get it. I know. (laughs) I think we just need to keep advocating for the word biohacking. We just need to keep supporting it. The best I know. Can. Yeah. I think, and I'm curious if you feel like this too, like something that I struggle with more now than maybe I did a few years ago in this space was like when I joined or like when I first started my Instagram page, and I think it was 2018, it was such a, it wasn't nearly as big of a community, but it was very male dominant. And now that I feel like I have a bigger voice in the space, it still feels very male dominant. And the word biohacking feels very male and masculine in general. And so now when I'm like, I'm so interested in women's health, I'm like, okay, how does this kind of like translate again? But then at the same time, I'm like, it is really nice to be a female in the space because there aren't a lot of us as well. So I don't know. How do you guys, like, how do you navigate being females in this like male dominant space? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a tough question. I think we're definitely, I think we have very similar missions, which is so, that's why it's so great to chat with you and to finally get to meet you in person at the conference, because I agree it, it has been very male dominant, but I think every year that I go to the biohacking conference, I feel like it gets a little bit better. It's not as significant as I would like to see year after year, but I think the more that we keep finding other women you know, creating these meetups, building these podcasts, building a social media presence, pushing to get us on stage at these events, giving the providers feedback. And I I even said, we need more female speakers next year. So hopefully they'll start to listen and change that. But I think we just have to keep fighting the good fight. I think there's a lot of us that are willing to do that. I mean, that night that we all met at the bar after the conference that night, I mean, there were a lot of, a good amount of women there. And I hadn't seen anything like that at the previous like three or four years. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah. So I'm like, that. that's one big step, but hopefully next year will be even better. Yeah, I agree with Renee. We just have to keep pushing our voices. And I think for the women that did get on stage at the conference, and I know, I know you had some thoughts on the conference, Brittany, we got to hear your episode. And the women that were on stage were still, in my opinion, not really representing the feelings behind biohacking or our intention and mission. Like we're still not teaching people how to biohack. And that's kind of the problem with the conventional education system. Teachers, and it's no fault of the teachers, I think it trickles down from higher, but the education system teaches people what to think rather than how to think. And I think that has certainly bled into the biohacking space where, you know, I think intentions are right, but we have to keep coming back to our North Star and our center and our grounding and say, like, how can we really help people? Because there is, I think we all agree, there's no one size fits all. So why do we get so dazzled by technology or blanket shock value statements? We have to keep coming back to the basics because I don't know about you, but we met so many people at that conference that were brand new to biohacking. If I was brand new, I would be so overwhelmed with all of the things to do. I would have gone home with a massive checklist. I didn't hear anyone talking about how to set up an N of one experiment. I didn't hear anyone talking about how to tune into your body's signals of communication, which is how we develop intuition. And that's how we really grow and learn. So yeah, I think our voices just have to be louder and louder. And we're here to support each other and do it together. Yeah, I I love that. I had I honestly I had a really good time at the conference, but I think my expectations maybe were a little off or maybe too high. Like I I really did want less of a sales pitch for a bunch of products and more of like this is how we can just be healthier. Like let's talk about like very simple practices and how to actually stick to it so we get the long-term health benefits from it. And I just was not hearing that narrative anywhere. It was like buy this product and buy this product, like sale after sale. And yeah, you're so right. Like for a newcomer, I couldn't imagine going there and being like, oh my gosh, okay, I have to buy this like sauna and this infrared light and this thing and this thing. Like, no, it's just too much. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing that the FDA is doing, right? They're like selling products, selling medications, selling processed foods. It's really the same thing. We're like looking for that magic pill solution and it just has been packaged in a different way. But I think we have to wake up and continue to help other people wake up and see that, yes, it does require hard work to be healthy, but if we can understand how to approach it, we'll be in a much better position. Yeah. Did you enjoy the conference this much this year as you have previous years? I yeah. <laughs> I I mean it's still always fun for me. And you know, I think every year I go to less and less of the talks because I felt like this year, you know, you scroll through the lecture titles and they all sound like really like attention grabbing and really cool, but then you see like sponsored by this product and you kind of know like okay, at some point in the lecture they're going to be pushing that product and I don't know. I can listen to that at home on podcasts and YouTube and like it's everywhere. (laughs) I don't want to like go sit in a room. So I really, I probably spent 90% of the time in the expo hall, just talking to people, meeting people that we've interviewed. And it's like a party to me. So like when I go in with that expectation, it is a lot of fun. But then Lauren and I kind of joke, like it's kind of an expensive party, but yeah, um, (laughs) really. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Not accessible for a lot of people, but yeah, I think that's why we have to keep pushing and navigating our way, but certainly a list of things that we would like to see. And I still just can't understand why a biohacking conference would be inside. Like, why is there not more nature just to start? Like, yeah. Where is the sunshine? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, especially in Florida in June. Like I tried to go outside and it was just like so muggy and rainy and hot. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, we got to go like middle of the country and find some grass. (laughs) Hopefully, you know, it's difficult with weather patterns these days, but I think there's a way around it. I think there is just too much emphasis on what can your money get you at this conference. I know. Showcase, yeah. I know. I, yeah, I feel the same way. And it's hard though, because it's, I met so many cool people and so many brands that I've worked with. And I'm sure it's same with you, like affiliates and stuff like that. But at the same time, 
I was like, do I want to come back next year? Is it really worth it like to do this? I don't know. Like, would I like to go to like a Paleo Valley or or Mind Valley, I guess it's called, or Goop has conferences and and like Goop is so centered around women's health that I feel like I would just absorb and learn so much at a conference like that. This one, and I have I talked to multiple female biohackers at the conference and afterwards, and so many we had the same thing of like where were the talks for the women? Like where was let's optimize hormones, fertility, new moms, like anything like that. Like even PCOS and and endometriosis, like things that are specific for women's health. Like where are the talks that are for us that are not just like a sales pitch? And I just didn't see it. You know that I seriously, seriously value the menstrual cycle and women's health. And I really care about helping women create more regular cycles, reduce their symptoms, and be able to just kind of live life (laughs) easier and have more fun and not have to worry so much about these health issues that kind of plague a lot of women, including myself. So I've recently actually been taking a new supplement by a company called Nochi, and the supplement is called New Moon, and it is a supplement completely focused on menstrual support. It is rooted in traditional Chinese medicine and uses herbs like ginger, ginseng, and jujube that provide a ton of benefits, including relief from menstrual cramps, reduces bloating, helps ease PMS symptoms, and supports irregular cycles. I deal with all of that here and there. It always changes cycle to cycle, but I definitely deal with irregular menstrual cycles every single month or more than that, you know? So I really love using this product and I love using something that's rooted in nature, but also traditional Chinese medicine because as someone who does acupuncture a lot and really respects traditional Chinese medicine, I can see how it can play such an important role in our tools that we use to help heal. So if you're dealing with any type of PMS, irregular cycles, you need menstrual support, I really suggest this product. I'm not taking anything else like it. And it's really, really fantastic. So that is by No Chi and that's the supplement called New Moon. And I will link it in the show notes. It's also on my website. Go for it. Try it out. Let me know what you think. You can use my discount. It's all linked right there for you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We don't need to be jumping to stem cells and peptides and like million yeah. devices if we're not talking about the basics and just cycle syncing at its most simplest. Yeah. I, Renee and I talk about this a lot, that biohacking, the community is really kind of narrowing in. It, it almost feels like we exist in a silo. And I think if we're really going to make some progress and help people at large, like help the global population, we have to start integrating with other industries, even just other industries of health. And I think Goop is such a great example. I think it's a great idea. Like maybe we just go party with the Goop people and start that (laughs) conversation rather than just mingling with other biohackers. You know, we have to like, we got to spread the wealth and start having other conversations. Of course, we're going to all be at this conference and agree with each other because we're biohackers, but are we actually helping the world? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, Uh, yeah. Well, I'll have to look up the Goop conferences. I'm definitely curious about that. And then another one I'm hoping to see grow is the Healthspan Summit, who Elias Arjan started. We, they, we've only had one so far, but it was such a great community of people. I mean, it was like experts in the field all the way to like, people that saw a flyer at Whole Foods and just like came on down in just like such a good mix of conversations, like the importance of community and relationships, but also nutrition and exercise and very minimal stuff about technology and stem cells and peptides. That was like such a small piece. So I would love to see that grow. No catalyst to red light beds. (laughs) 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 $140,000 beds. Yeah. It looks cool, but (laughs) that was when I saw that. I, it looks like something from a movie. Like, definitely. (laughs) I'm like, who's gonna, who's gonna buy that? How, I wanna know how many did they sell at that conference? So curious. Yeah. I just, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, we tried to like book a time to go and try it out, and it was completely full. There was no spots available for any of the days. So I'm Same. sure they 
Yeah. yeah, we went we went over at like 10 a.m. Friday morning, the first day, and they were like, it's already booked up. I was like, all right. Yeah, oh, well. I don't know. <laughs> I also feel like I would love, oh man, there's so many. Like there's the Health Optimization Summit that's in the UK. And I think Ben Greenfield went to that one this year. And I wonder if that's a bit better. But then I'm also like, Tim Gray puts that on and I just like... <laughs> Is it just the same thing in a different country type of vibe? I don't know. I have That's to think about it. Ben. Yeah, I know Ben. I, I know Ben definitely really supports that, and I'm one of Ben's coaches. And he actually he says a lot. He doesn't like the word biohacking. I know, he, which is like so funny because you always think of him as a biohacker, and he's like, I don't want people to call me a biohacker. He's like, I'm a health. What is it? Health advocate. And like he uses different words, but yeah, he loves that summit over there. So I don't know. Maybe we'll all have to fly over there next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, and I don't know if you're the same way. I find that I actually listen to Ben's podcast a lot more than Dave's. Like, I don't know the last time I actually listened to any of Dave's episodes. Are you like similar to that? I can't listen to five minutes of it. <laughs> of either oh of them? Gosh. No, no, no ben. Dave's. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. I love Ben yeah. Greenfield. I think he shares really amazing information. And I love that he's always changing. I think we need to do that. We need to accept change in each other and keep kind of challenging the narrative. And he's done that. I know he's potentially annoyed a lot of people, but like good on him for speaking his truth. But the other one, I just think is so motivated by money. It's really difficult for me to drop in there. I know. I feel the same way. I think there's something really relatable about Ben. And I don't know what it is because we're very different, but I guess we both like health, but there's just something, I guess it's maybe just the way he talks about his family. He just comes off a bit more genuine, I think maybe. Yeah, he does change his mind. It's like when he changed his mind about like psilocybin and using mushrooms and stuff like that, I think that was like maybe last year. And he's like, oh, I don't use it anymore because it's against my faith. I was like, whoa, this is a really big thing, but like, okay, good for you, you know? Yeah, we have to challenge those narratives. I know Renee has opinions because she's a coach of his, but I thought I didn't agree with him, but I thought it was so important for the conversation for him to go there. Yeah, no, I definitely respect that. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched it happen pretty much overnight. Like one day we were on a call talking about like Paul Stamets microdosing protocol. And then like the next month it was like, we're not talking about that anymore. We're looking more at family relationships and parenting and not talking about plant medicine anymore. But yeah, I, I I have to respect that, that he discovered. And he doesn't even say that no one should do it. He just believes it's such a small percentage of the population that should be exploring that. And yeah, I mean, maybe he's being a little more conservative in that approach, but some people are out there saying like, everyone should be doing plant medicine. And that's just as... <laughs> frightening to hear. Yeah. What's it like being a coach for him? Yeah, it's been a great experience. The clients that come through his coaching program are very experienced biohackers. So it's definitely like a different clientele. Like people come to me and they're like, okay, I have a CGM and aura ring and a bio strap and a infrared sauna <laughs> and a cold plunge. How do I optimize? <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. And then I have, here's my 100 pages of lab testing I already did versus like I have another doctor in Maryland that refers to me and I, I'm trying to get those people off of McDonald's. So it's like, it's such an extreme, but it's cool to see people that are so into biohacking and they know so much about health optimization when they don't do it for a living. So it's exciting to see. I think, I mean, Ben has definitely built an amazing community and an amazing brand. I'm really grateful for what he's done. Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine how challenging that would be to try to help people level up when they've already just done so much. And you're like, okay, wow, I really have to think about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes getting people off at McDonald's feels really hard, but like you're right when someone's already optimized to the 99%, you know, you're like, what else can I do? But but they're also, those people are so willing to make whatever changes. Like there's not really any handholding or convincing. It's just like, hey, I think you should try this. And they're already off doing it. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you have new people come to you, whether it's a client or like in your social media or your audience and they 
ask you about biohacking. Like, where do you generally recommend people start if they kind of aren't super healthy to begin with? Yeah, great question. Lauren, do you want me to jump in or you want to jump in? I would say just to start, if they don't have a wearable, we always just like to get someone in touch with a wearable just to start gathering some feedback to start a conversation. And we love really balancing the objective data with subjective data. So while we're doing that, you know, it almost doesn't matter what the wearable is, but can we just start to get some kind of number of feedback while we do the subjective stuff like journaling or just paying attention to your physical body, doing some somatic work? Like, can we gather as much information as possible so that we have like some puzzle pieces to work with? So for people that have nothing, it's like, let's just commit to one thing and start super simple. I think is a good starting point. Yeah. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think just at least one wearable just to have a tracker, but I think always like checking off all of like the ancestral hacking components first, as much as you can, right? The things that Brittany, you talk about all the time and on social media, like getting outside, getting your morning sunshine, getting your feet on the earth, like how much of the ancestral free stuff can we do first? And then looking at diet, like what small tweaks can we make? before we start getting into like more expensive lab testing or more tech and devices. It's like, I feel like there's just so many free things people are not doing that we can check off first. Yeah. Even just with supplements, because it's so easy, I think as a nutrition health practitioner, like I run a lot of lab tests. It would be so easy to say, oh, it looks like you're deficient in this. Let's just take a bunch of supplements. But then we're getting pulled into that conventional medicine model. So like Renee said, you know, if someone's eating McDonald's, supplements probably aren't going to do them much good, right? We got to like start eating real food, make sure they're getting sunshine, sleeping well. And then we layer in those things later on. But unless the behavioral practices are there, there's kind of no sense in going forward. So, and I do a lot of metabolic health coaching with CGMs. And a lot of people are like, I want to do berberine and I want to add in all these blood sugar sensitizing supplements. But they're, they're not sitting down to eat. They're not chewing. They're always stressed. So we got to talk about the nervous system and how they're eating before we can take Burberry. And like, what's the point really, right? If we're not, if our bodies are not in the right environment to even receive nutrients, that has to be habitual and integrated first. And I think you would agree with that, I'm assuming. Hello, it's Brittany here, and I've got something life-changing to share with you. Sleep is crucial for our productivity, well-being, and beauty, Right. No one wants to wake up with dehydration lines and dark circles. That has definitely happened to me. Picture this. You wake up feeling refreshed. Your skin is glowing. Yes, get it. And those pesky dehydration lines and dark circles, they're nowhere in sight. Sounds like a dream, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not only possible, but it's also within your reach. I used to struggle with falling asleep. There was a time when getting a good night's sleep felt like chasing unicorns, tossing and turning, waking up multiple times, and feeling like a zombie the next day. Seriously, that happened to me for a long time until about 2019, 2020, when I started biohacking my sleep. But then recently, it started happening again, and I actually uncovered the ultimate secret that's really been helping me, and that is magnesium breakthrough. It has completely transformed my sleep and got me sleeping so good again. So what's important to know is that not all magnesium supplements are created equal, so don't waste your time with over-the-counter options. Magnesium Breakthrough is the real deal. It combines seven different forms of magnesium in a single capsule, giving you the full-spectrum magnesium experience you need for optimal results. So here's my nightly routine that I've been doing. I take two capsules of magnesium breakthrough with water about an hour before bed. The effects are remarkable. I drift off faster and enjoy deeper, more rejuvenating sleep. And then when the morning comes, I wake up feeling refreshed, energized, and ready to conquer the day. And I wake up at 5 a.m. So I'm not messing around, okay? I need my good sleep. So say goodbye to restless nights and tired mornings and unlock your best sleep with Magnesium Breakthrough. Ready for my offer? Visit magbreakthrough.com slash biohackingbritney and enter the code biohackingbritney for a discount. We love discounts. Remember, this offer is only available on this special website. So if you go to Bioptimizer's normal website, it's not going to happen. It's not there. So don't let sleepless nights hold you back any longer. That's mag breakthrough.com slash biohacking Brittany 
Use my discount code BiohackingBrittany to save. Woo-hoo! And let me know how your sleep is going. Yeah, I yeah, I agree with everything you both said. I think that I think it's hard to it's hard to just recommend one thing. Most of the time there's like a whole systemic issue going on. And also like even the mental aspect of it in the first place, like the motivation behind everything really is actually what matters. So if you don't have a strong enough why as to why you need to get healthier and maintain that, you're probably going to just fall off the bandwagon again. So it's even like before we even talk about the practices, it's like understanding like what is your big motivation here? And some people it will be like, I want to run around with my grandkids or I want to prevent X, Y, and Z disease coming that is in my family history. And I'm going to do that through lifestyle practices. Like there has to be something I think much bigger than the person. And then that's where like the real success comes. And that's what I've seen and I do for myself, but yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I'll just say, I've seen motivations really change over the years. Like when I first started health coaching and I actually started as a personal trainer and then got into health coaching, but really like 20 years ago, I found most people were coming and they just wanted these body composition goals, right? It was all about how we looked and losing weight. And now I feel like the narrative has really shifted thanks to all the education that's out there and podcasting, like amazing that that's such a thing now. But now people are coming and they are saying, you know, my my mother had this, my father had this, my sister is struggling with this. I I don't want that to be me. Like there definitely are a lot more preventative motivations than I used to see, which I think is really, really awesome because I think the hardest thing as a health coach is trying to convince someone that they need to do something before there's a problem. And right, we can only meet the client where they're at. And so if that person's not there, actually can be tricky, right? Like we can show up and listen and make sure that they feel heard and seen because that's valuable in health coaching. We can talk about the ancestral stuff. But as you said, like if they don't have a why, we can only take them as far as they want to go. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I also think as you get older, the why changes as well. I think when you're younger, it's very like almost like cosmetic and looks based. And then as you get older, it kind of becomes more about maintaining athleticism or performance or things like that, which I think makes a lot of sense. I'm curious. So like I'm in Canada, you are both in the States and we have very similar demographics in terms of population and in terms of like obesity in populations. And I actually just saw this TikTok video on the weekend and made me think of this is like, there's so much normalizing obesity now and almost like shaming people who want to be healthier and kind of like shaming the weight loss journey. And so how do you navigate that now in this society when we know that you are healthier when you are at a better weight? Like it just feels so sticky almost. Oh, it is. It's sticky and icky and all the things. Renee, I'll let you jump in because I may not stop talking if I start. Oh, no, I know you have a lot to say. Actually, Lauren was on Fox News a couple of months ago to talk about this exact topic. And it was, Lauren, like kudos to you because it's it's a tricky topic to navigate. You certainly don't want to offend anyone, but we also want to educate. Being obese is not okay. I mean, we know you're at higher risk for every chronic disease, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, I mean, diabetes, like you can't argue that. And coming from someone that struggled with an eating disorder for over a decade with my years in ballet, like I know what it's like to hate your body and it feels awful. And I don't want anyone to feel that way either. So it's like, how do we find this middle ground of loving your body in a certain weight limit, I would say? but also being healthy. Okay, maybe 10, 15 pounds overweight, but you feel good in your skin and you feel healthy. You have no health complaints. That's amazing. We're not trying to be like Barbie thin nowadays. That's not what we're going for. But it's like, we got to find this middle ground of being healthy and loving ourselves at the same time. And I don't know what the perfect answer is. It's, I think, different for everyone. Yeah. Oh gosh. It's so it's, there's so much, but I think the pendulum definitely has swung too far in the opposite direction where now we're not taking responsibility for our health because we found this rock to hide behind, which we could say exists in a lot of different spaces and things in life. Like we've been given an excuse. 
so that we don't have to do the hard work. We all knew that health was hard work. And now it's like, oh, it's okay. You don't have to do it, but it's not okay. If you are obese, that means you are metabolically unhealthy, right? A lot of people think I'm going to lose weight to get healthy, but it doesn't work like that. You have to get healthy to lose weight. If you're already obese, so many things downstream or sorry, so many things upstream have already gone wrong. So now the downstream has really completely flooded. So I think we really just have to keep pushing this narrative that metabolic health is at the root, I think, of all health, of cardiovascular disease, mental health. And we know that's a huge issue, really, in our culture, and I think worldwide. And a lot of that, I think, is just perpetuated by the food industry that's still kicking out processed foods that hijack our brains. So it's hard to even make rational, good decisions for ourselves because we're being poisoned. So yeah, again, I think we just have to keep educating, but I, I am staunchly against just letting children eat whatever they want. I think, you know, parenting is a verb. We have to educate our children. And there is, so the Fox News thing that I, I went on TV to speak about was in response to a woman that wrote a book that essentially said that she, that we should let our children eat whatever they want, because if they eat whatever they want, they will naturally build an intuition to then eat the things that are good for them. But that completely ignored that the food industry is poisoning us. Like, how do you let children find intuition if their brain is being hijacked? I don't really think that that's possible. Yeah, that's shocking. Well, is it shocking? I don't know. No, I, I know. Mean, nothing's shocking anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, now in the U.S., I mean, they, I don't remember who released it, but they said, you know, 80% of obesity is genetic. So people hear that on the news. And I mean, if you believe that, wouldn't you just give up when you'd be yeah. like, well, I guess it's genetic. My parents are obese. My grandparents were. And why Nothing bother trying? Do. I'm like that. That should be illegal to release a statistic like that. Yeah. I just, it shocks me when I see photos of American society from like the eighties or the seventies, it'll be like a photo of, you know, a hundred people at the beach or something in California. And the size of the people is like a lot smaller than if you were to take that photo today. And it, it's just so different. Like I just saw one recently and I was like, wow, like everybody is like a, I don't want to say normal, but like a, let's say healthy or size or healthier shape, whatever you want to say. And now it's just so different. And we've become so normalized and accustomed to seeing it that we don't see it as much of an issue. And then if you dare to talk about losing weight or becoming healthier on social media, you have to be so careful about how you word it because you don't want to word it as like, there's something wrong with me and I'm fixing it and I'm going to be better. You know what I mean? And like, even right now I'm doing this new fitness challenge. And then I was thinking, I was like, okay, should I do like before and after photos? Then I was like, okay, if I do that, how do I word it so that I'm like not triggering people and like everyone's so sensitive now. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think that's really just so beautiful and responsible of you that you're even having that th thought process. I mean, we do have to be as sensitive and compassionate as possible, but I think at the end of the day, we are going to potentially trigger some people and that's not necessarily our doing, right? People have their own insecurities and, and triggers. I think if our intentions are to continue to educate and we check ourselves, like I, I think we're going to upset people. We're going to maybe step on toes, but I think we have to kind of live in that danger zone just a little bit. Otherwise, nothing's ever going to change. Are you tired of feeling out of sync with your body's natural rhythm? Do you struggle with menstrual cycle related issues like fatigue, mood swings, and bloating? If you're looking to optimize your health and well-being, look no further than the ebb and flow cycle guide. This comprehensive guide is designed to help you better understand and work with your menstrual cycle so you can improve your energy levels, reduce PMS symptoms, and gain a deeper understanding of your body. With in-depth information on each phase of the menstrual cycle, you'll learn how to adjust your diet, exercise routine, and self-care practices to better align with your body's needs. One of the biggest benefits of the Ebb and Flow Cycle Guide is its user-friendly format. The guide is easy to follow and provides clear instructions on how to optimize your health throughout each phase of your cycle. Plus, it's packed with valuable information and insights that you won't find anywhere else. 
So whether you're a seasoned biohacker or you're just starting out, the Ebb and Flow Cycle Guide is the perfect tool to help you optimize your health and live in harmony with your body's natural rhythm. And with my expertise and guidance, you can trust that you're getting the best information and advice available. So why wait? Head over to biohackingbrittany.com to get your copy of the Ebb and Flow Cycle Guide and start living your best life today. Yeah, no, I think you're so right. And on the parenting note, the video that I saw on TikTok on the weekend was this guy who was reading a Bernstein Bears book, like one of those kid books. And I guess it was one from the 80s. And I don't know if I had it when I was a kid, but or maybe 90s, but it was basically like, I think the title was like, let's get healthier as a family or something. And it was the mom like throwing out like the chips and the cookies going to the doctor and being like, let's all get healthier and like buying all this healthy food. And then the kids and the whole family of bears, like do a little like 5k run and marathon, whatever. I don't know. But the guy talking about the book was like criticizing it. And he's like, look how inappropriate this is. Like this mom is just fat shaming her children. How could she do this? And then I saw that I was like, no way. And then I go to the comments and all of the comments are supporting him being like, oh yeah, this mom is totally out of line. Like this is not appropriate, all of this stuff. And I'm like, am I the only person who thinks like, good job mom for like helping her kids be healthier? Like, what do you mean? (gasps) Oh, we're certainly not alone. It is pretty wild. I mean, but that's like the platform that social media is on. It really fires people up and divides. We know this is, it's an issue, but I just, uh, yeah. And especially, Yeah. Like as I'm on my own, like fertility journey myself, and I think about having kids, I'm like, I just don't think that I would be okay with that. And I, again, I don't want to fat shame. And it's like this whole complicated dynamic now of wanting to have a healthy family, but also not wanting to trigger them or have these issues come up. And I'm not an expert, so I don't know, maybe I'll have to do some more research. I think parenting is definitely the hardest job. And I'm actually reading this book really, really fascinating. It's called Women Without Kids. I'm almost done. And I highly recommend it. It's a really interesting perspective of just like how as women, we are raised to think like, you get married, you have kids. That's just like what you do as a female on this planet. But she has like a totally different perspective on it. And one of the things she actually says is, a lot of women think that they need to be a mom so they can connect with other women and build this community of moms. But more often than not, when they become a mom and they get into that community, they feel lonelier because they don't agree. When you see you don't agree on parenting strategies and just like the way you're raising your kids, it actually can divide you from other moms. And then you feel lonelier. I was like, wow, I never really thought of it that way. But you're right. Like parenting is so hard and everyone has their own way of doing it. So interesting book. I recommend it. Yeah, I will definitely check that out. Cause I mean, yeah, I'm sure as you know, like people are having less kids and like, yeah, we have multiple friends who just don't want kids at all, which is totally fine. It's just like such a different way of thinking now. Yeah. yeah. Actually, they, she said 58% of millennials that were surveyed said they would rather adopt a pet than have a kid. Oh, isn't that crazy? <laughs> 58% of millennials. Wow. That is crazy. Is that just in North America or is that like worldwide? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, she lives in the UK, so I don't know. I don't know if that was based just in the UK or worldwide. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Anyways, that was a tangent on parenting. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I understand. So I want to hear from both of you. What are the most impactful biohacks you have ever done in your entire lives? (laughs) Mm, so many. <laughs> well, I think the way that I first qualify my start of biohacking was going from a vegetarian back to eating carnivore. I don't know that I called it biohacking at the time, but I was very influenced in college. I moved to New York City. My mom totally called it. She was like, you're going to move to New York and you're going to come vegetarian because it's popular. Everyone's doing it. And I did. And I was vegetarian for seven years. You know, I was doing all the education on the dangers of commercial farming and all the hormones. I was like, you know, I can't eat that. It's so toxic and making my body sick. And I wasn't listening to my body at the time. But 
I was very like staunch and dedicated to this mission to not consume animals. And after seven years of that, I realized I was tired, I was injured, and I was getting sick all the time. So I had an acupuncturist recommend me incorporating some meat again. And it was such a light bulb moment. I, I had venison stew as my first entry back in. And I was like, oh my gosh. I immediately felt this surge of energy. And I think the light bulb went off and said, wait, I get to experiment and play with food to figure out what's going to make me feel best. And I think that was the first time that I realized that I had that power. So I don't know that we would call traditionally call that a biohack going from vegetarian to carnivore, but it was my realization that I could start being my own guru and run these end of one experiments. So I never looked back from that. But since then, definitely getting sleep in order. So using wearables has been invaluable. I'll just mention one piece of tech because I do think there's a space for tech. There is a device called the Newbie. So it is a version of eStim. It's neurological re-education for your muscles. So essentially we're communicating with the brain to then talk to our muscles. So when we have injury, the idea is that sites of our body shut down in effort to protect. We go into fight or flight and there's like a protection survival mode. So then, you know, we limit mobility. We start to adapt to the injury. And this machine really helps us to calm down that stressful fight or flight response. So we can start re-educating our muscles, our movement patterns. And I had an ankle injury that I swear, you know, I can't go back in time and, and prove this causation. But there was a piece of biohacking tech that I used. And the next day I was in severe ankle pain. And I did everything to biohack the situation, acupuncture, went to the chiropractor, PT, red light, cold exposure, peptides, all the things. And nothing helped me until I tried the new fit. And it was because my body had to get out of fight, fight or flight and really trust that I could move on my own again. So that was just like a really cool experience with technology. I think there's been a lot of cool things, but that one really stands out in my mind as something that was like mind blowing, really. Wow. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad you were able to figure that out and really heal from that. Yeah, life changing. So I invested in a machine and I have it and I use it. I'm just so grateful for it. So, you know, there's some times where I think the investment really can make a huge difference. But I know Renee probably will mention sleep. I think and I'm, I bet you would agree with this too, Brittany. Like if you're sleeping, a lot of other things are going to happen. Really, they're going to go well in your life. So. Absolutely. Renee, what would yours be? Yeah, I guess to transition into sleep. Yeah. I, I mean, sleep optimization has been at the top of my list and whatever that means to you, right? Sleep hygiene, supplements, devices. I think you have to figure out really what personally will optimize your quality of sleep. But for me, you know, like I, I totally burned out by age 22. I ended up with like you know, adrenal fatigue. I had mercury toxicity, Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. I had all of these things just like compounding on the fact that I also hadn't slept more than four to five hours a night for many years. I just like totally crashed and burned. And so fixing my sleep was definitely at the top of the list, but not only getting more sleep and better quality sleep, but then also learning to, similar to what Lauren said, is to get out of that fight or flight state. So I'm like, I don't know if it's like the rushing woman syndrome thing, like being addicted to the doing and the busyness and the go, 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 being productive all the time. That definitely led to my burnout as well. But I didn't even realize what it felt like to not be in a sympathetic state until in 2010, our dad I actually heard about this new piece of equipment called the Light Portal. Actually, back then it was called the Life Force. And there were only four in the country. And at the time I was living in Tampa, Florida. And my dad calls and he says, there's four in the country and one of them is in Tampa. You have to go check this thing out. I'm like, all right, I'll like be a little guinea pig for you. Why not? So I go and I check this thing out. It's a one hour session. You lay in this like big chamber. It almost looks like a coffin, but it's using vibration, binaural beats, crystals, color therapy, the wood is made from like amazing wood that they use to make violins, like just very, very healing, definitely puts you into a parasympathetic state really quickly. And I went in there and within like 10 minutes, 
I felt so relaxed and rejuvenated, like nothing I had ever experienced before. And my brain started creating all these like creative thoughts. <laughs> I would like think of like business strategies and marketing ideas. And I'm like, what is this part of my brain that I have never accessed before? And so anyways, the reason I'm saying that is that was my introduction to like, oh, this is what parasympathetic feels like. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I've been living in sympathetic my whole life. And so that piece of equipment was great. Convinced my dad to actually buy one in Maryland. I used it a lot when I lived there and worked there, which was great. But then since I moved to Vegas, I don't have access to that. So this is where the brain tap has actually come in and been really helpful for me. It's not as powerful as the light portal, but it's something that's obviously easy to travel with. It's a lot cheaper. You know, it's like 600 bucks. I use that for like 30 minutes every day. And it has taught me how to get back into that parasympathetic state really quickly. I used to try and meditate and it just like didn't really work for me. So for me, the brain tap has been like such a game changer. I know it's not for everyone, but for me, I think I would have to say that's my number one favorite biohack. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, that's, so that was yeah. a long story for to get to that, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add on, I think it's interesting because we both brought up tech and we certainly don't want the biohacking space to think that you need tech by any means, but sometimes it can be the entry point to profound healing. But I think what the takeaway is, can we do less? Can we find stillness and let our bodies be in that nervous system balance? Like Renee said, the parasympathetic can we allow our bodies to talk to us? And I think that has been our experience with all of these modalities is that it was like this light bulb to go, wait, our bodies can heal if we can get them in the right environment. So do you need these fancy, really expensive tech? Maybe if you have access to it, but I think there's so many ways that we can downregulate and really be more productive by doing less. And this is something I learned from Paul Check. He teaches four doctors. So it's diet, nutrition, movement. My favorite one is Dr. Quiet. Dr. Quiet is how still and quiet can you be because your body is going to talk to you if you allow up the space. And I think just in our culture, we don't allow that, right? Like we're a dopamine addicted culture. We're always seeking the next reward behavior. There's very little time for pause, quiet reflection. And so anything that you can do, if meditation is not your thing, it could just be sitting in nature and being quiet. It could be just getting morning sunshine. It could be, you know, carving out just a little bit, a little bit more time just to move a little slower. I think all of these things help to get our body into homeostasis where we can heal with or without the tech. I love that. Yeah. Just like unplugging in general, I think is overrated. Or wait, yeah. underrated. Yeah. Underrated. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I, I just don't think we do it enough, you know? And there's something so nice about it when you do it. Like if you're lying on the grass and it's sunny outside and it's warm, like, can you really be stressed in that moment? I don't mm. know. You know, it would, be, it would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. does feel so amazing. I know yeah. nature is unbelievably healing. It is. It is. Yeah. Mother nature is just like the OG, OG biohacker for sure. Or like yeah, she, she yeah. gets all the credit. And I think we have to keep Love educating that. on that. And I don't know how we get our culture away from like the do, do, do the busyness. I'm certainly surrounded by it in a big city like New York, but how can we take the pressure off, especially from women for women that feel like they have to take care of everyone in their lives. How often I'm sure you meet with clients all the time, the females that are like, I put myself last always. Like we have to shift that narrative for people. We have to. You know, I love gathering data on myself. And I think this is so important as a biohacker, nutritionist, and just wellness advocate. I don't like making decisions based off of just guessing and my intuition only, but I like to have data as well to really guide me and help me make the most sense of what is going on in my body on a cellular level. That is why I test with Inside Tracker every single quarter or more, to be honest. And I love all of the information they provide. It is an at home blood test. They come, they take a look at over 45 different biomarkers, including minerals, vitamins, hormones, and really give you a big picture on what is going on inside your body at that time. If you're in Canada, they come they to your house, they do the test for you. That's where I am. States, the same thing. Or you can also go to a lab and get it done as well. And they also have a biological age test 
that is a calculation based off of your results. And that's called inner age. This is really fascinating. Mine is usually about 10 years younger than I actually am. So I'm always really proud of that when I see that result. But what's really cool is recently Inside Tracker has made great strides and they've actually added new biomarkers to their ultimate test. So they've added things like APO B this year and they've which is critical for like heart health. And they've also added three hormone markers, which is really important for aging as well as women's health. And I've spoken about that before. So they test like progesterone, estradiol, and your thyroid as well. And so now they've added something new again, which is insulin, which is the key biomarker for sustained energy and an early warning for several chronic diseases. So everyone knows how important insulin is and glucose. So it's honestly so helpful to be able to add this in to this test. I really suggest if you're dealing with symptoms or some sort of health issue, but you don't really know what's going on, you need to get data on yourself to make sense of it. So I really suggest doing something like this. You can order the ultimate test. If you use my discount code, you get 20% off, which is actually a lot because it makes a big difference when you're getting something done like this. I will link it in the show notes for you. It's also on my website on biohackingbrittany.com. And that is Inside Tracker. And my discount code is Biohacking Brittany in all capitals. Feel free to use it, get tested. And honestly, if you have any questions about your results, they have an app that helps you and gives you a ton of resources and recommendations based off of your personal results. So super helpful as well. That's Inside Tracker and it is linked in the show notes and on my website. Yeah, no, you're completely right. I'm curious if there's any biohacks that you've tried that maybe haven't been super great or successful or you've just done it once and been like, okay, never again type of thing. I I mean, I just really hate cold plunges and cryotherapy. Oh no way. <laughs> I just hate it. Yep. She's the sauna queen. I'm the cold plunge gal. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. I love my sauna. I use it every other day at the cold therapy. And I don't know if some of it is like what I said about the sympathetic dominance and the adrenal issues. Like, I don't know if maybe still my body is intuitively telling me I shouldn't be doing those therapies. Maybe. I just am not drawn to it and I'm miserable when I do it. (laughs) I would say that. And then kind of another interesting one is lately I've been experimenting with like different CBDs. Oh, interesting. Full spectrum and broad spectrum. And over the years, what I have seen is CBD oil with no THC, I do great with. My sleep quality is like on point. A little bit of THC, I see like my resting heart rate is higher, my HRV drops, but there's a new product on the market where they're promoting that this product that has some THC in it is increasing HRV. And the research is showing it is working for a lot of people except young women, thin women. So I can definitely attest to like, it doesn't work for me. So I don't know if Brittany, you've tried this new product. Is it Mode and Method? Mode and Method? Yeah. 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 I'm friends with uh, the people at Spermidine Life and yeah, I have some of it, but I haven't tried it. Okay. You'll have to let me know. I'm so okay. curious how you do with it. Cause even Don said, Don's the one that told me, he said young, thin females, just sometimes it doesn't work. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. Exciting. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah. They didn't tell me that, but it's also hard to get in Canada right now. So it's like less of a thing that I'm really working on them with, but that's so interesting because I have a sample pack and I haven't tried it. Do you think it just causes more like anxiety and stress? Like for me, I like I can't even touch weed at all because it causes anxiety, like my like rapid heart rate and stuff. But that's if you're doing, you know, five to 10 milligrams of THC. These supplements have like one milligram and I still get an increase in heart rate and a reduction in HRV. So try, just try one capsule and see see how you do. Let us know. Yeah, I will. But you know, that's so interesting because like when I do gummies or like eat gummies that have CBD and THC in them, I usually do the smallest ones I can find about like two milligrams of THC. And 
it definitely impacts my HRV and definitely impacts my heart rate. And I have the aura ring data to show that for sure. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. That's, (laughs) that's so good to know. And then, yeah, Lauren, what do you think? I'm going to say mouth taping. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. I guess just one, I'll speak from personal experience. I have not seen any change in my sleep stats or recovery stats with mouth taping. But I think also we feel really responsible to do some education around this because our dad's a biological dentist and he looks at sleep disordered breathing and sleep apnea. He does a lot of work in optimizing airways and jaw structures. And I think there's not enough people that are talking about not closing off the space where you can get air if your nasal passages are closed, right? Like we're closing the opportunity for oxygen where in some people that really would not be optimal in some cases could be quite dangerous. So just from personal experience, I haven't seen much benefit and I just think it's overly prescribed in the biohacking space. And again, we're not talking about like, what's the reason why maybe we'd want to do this? Are we looking at our stats? And also, can you even breathe through your nose before you close your mouth? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I have some and I I definitely use it like on and off, definitely not every single night. And I I think it's great for some people for sure. But again, it's that like over prescribing of like a single product and it's going to fix everyone and everything type of thing that just like really is not it and doesn't work. Brittany, I'm curious, have you had one thing like that that you just feel like didn't really help or? I found for a while that like red light therapy was doing nothing for me. And then I had a red light therapy expert come on the podcast and basically off air, she told me that the brands that I had were basically garbage. And then I got a different brand and I'm looking at getting a sunlight sauna with their red light therapy that comes in theirs and like getting her to like approve it and take a look at it. And so that was something that really changed my perspective because, you know, when I started in biohacking, there was like Juve and maybe like one other company. And now there's so many red light therapy companies and you go onto Amazon and you're like, oh, this is so much cheaper. I'll just buy it on here. But then like you're doing it every day and you don't see any results in maybe your skin or your muscle functioning or your energy or anything. And then you're like, okay, this is just kind of like a waste. So that's definitely been a learning curve for me is to like understand the technology better. That's yeah, such a good point. Definitely and, matters. And I think in the cheaper red lights potentially are producing a lot of EMFs. So it's like, is it doing more harm? Yeah, that's so interesting. Exactly. And the, it's interesting as well, like with all of these product companies in the space, like the intention seems so good, but then the more experts you talk to and like you have a podcast, I'm sure you understand is like, the more you kind of understand actually how these products work. And then you're like, oh, you, your products actually aren't that great. I can see through, like I understand now much better. And there are some big brands that are like that, like that I won't mention that I actually don't use their products anymore because yeah, I just know, I know better now, but it's, maybe it's like that in every industry, right? Like people are just trying to push a sale. Yeah, push a sale, or maybe they had a good experience and they're just excited to bring it to other people. But I think there's always like, we have to wait for the shoe to drop. We got to make sure we have all the information. It's super hard to do. I don't, it's kind of hard to know who to fault, but certainly making money is a big motivation for some people. I know. And then like people cut corners because it's cheaper to make a product a certain way. And then they still trying to sell it, you know, maybe with certain claims on it. And it's hard. Like even as somebody in this space, the marketing is so good. There's so much you're like, oh, this is natural. This is like greenwashing me, but it's fine. I like totally believe it's going to help me. So yeah, I don't yeah. Know. the marketing is so powerful. I always use my fiance as like the guinea pig. I get to see how he responds to marketing because he's not in this industry, but he is kind of a byproduct of being in the family. But even just like the foods that he'll buy, you know, he'll go to the grocery store and come home and be like, oh my gosh, aren't you so proud of me? Look what I got. I'm like, oh, Oh. but let's look at the ingredients. I'm like, oh, I love you, but you fell victim to marketing. They are powerful. They are very strong and good at what they do. We have to be educated consumers. Oh yeah. My, my husband's the same way. Like 
Yeah, it'll say like keto on it, right? So he'll buy like keto cookies or keto crackers. And then you read the ingredients and it's like, just got like canola oil in it Mm -hmm. or whatever else it is. And I'm like, okay, just ignore the words on the front and just read the ingredient list. Okay. That's good advice. Very good advice. (laughs) Don't look at the pretty packaging. It gets everybody. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I do it too. Sometimes there's been, gosh, what did I buy recently? I think it was some kind of hummus that was made from, I, it was some kind of sprouted bean or seed. And I was like, Ooh, this looks awesome and healthy. It was like a green goddess hummus. And I got home and same thing. It was canola oil. Like it can happen to the best of us, you know? Yeah. Actually, my husband and I were just flying and we went into like the little airport store, like the Hudson News or whatever. And I just like to look at what's in there again, like to see the marketing that people are exposed to. And there was this big section of all these little bags of like nuts and seeds and trail mixes and stuff. But all the colors were like this warm, earthy beige and green. And my husband, he even he looks at it and he goes, oh, does this mean like this is a healthy brand because the colors? And I'm like, I was like, that's funny. He says that. I'm like, let me look. And I I pulled a bunch of the bags off and look at the labels. And it was all like roasted in canola oil and sugar in the trail mix and stuff. But the colors were so attractive. Oh, they are sneaky. Yeah. So sneaky. smart. So smart. <laughs> there's There's so many products like that, though. Like even when buying kombucha, a lot of the time, like you turn it around and there's so much sugar in it. And you're like, okay, like... Yeah, it's fermented. It's probably great for my gut to a certain point, but then the sugar kind of overrides how good it is for my gut because of the bacteria. So, yeah. yeah. Do you it's, remember when kombucha first became a thing and it was like three grams in a bottle? Like, GC no, first came out. Oh, it was. Was so it like different. that? Wow. Oh, there was hardly any sugar. And then just every year it was like five grams, seven grams, 10 grams, 20 grams, like 30. Oh. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And now there's like all the different flavors and it's, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to navigate. So what is next for the biohacker babes? What's coming up for you guys? Ooh, good question. Good question. I would say something that's really has my interest and has really for the last year is really leaning into this mental health epidemic that I think that we're in through the lens of metabolic health. As I mentioned, I do a lot of continuous glucose monitoring coaching, and I think it's such a fabulous opportunity, one, just to personalize your nutrition. I I know you know the benefits of it, but connecting that to the mental health dysregulation that we're seeing so we can really help people and just such as a preventative tool, I think we need to spread that wider and hopefully the accessibility will continue to grow. But it's what I'm feeling pretty jazzed about right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I would say the most exciting thing to me right now is I'm really hyped up about like the longevity and health span stuff. Like I'm looking into maybe doing like a longevity coach certification just because I love to always be learning. And then even maybe going to RadFest. Brittany, have you ever been to RadFest? No. What is that? It's, oh, I always forget what it stands for. Something like Radical Aging Extension something. It's a conference in California every year, but it's in Anaheim in September. I'm considering going to that because people say it's a pretty fascinating conference. So stay tuned. But yeah, oh, I just like anything that's going to make us live longer, I'm so interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you doing? Where is that new certification at? The one that you were just mentioning? That one's online. Okay. Yeah. I can send it to you. Yeah, absolutely. Because I am looking at doing more education. So oh, I'm, cool. I'm just trying to decide what to do. And I was actually looking at the Czech Institute today because they have a couple of women's health courses, online courses that look good. I have either of you done them? I love I've that. done so Sarah Gustafson has a continuing ed. Yeah, it's a, actually a, a very quick course, but it is really nice because it pulls in all of the Czech principles, with Dr. Quiet, like really looking at mindset, emotional connections. It I would say it's it's like the Czech version of cycle syncing. <laughs> so okay. it would be pretty easy for you. You would fly right through it, but I think it is kind of cool just to get on there wavelength. I love all of their education. Nice. Yeah. And then I know Nathan Riley also has like a fertility one on there as well. It looks really short as well, but just like, I'm just interested in it. Yeah. Nice. Oh, oh, that's so fun cool. to learn. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, if people want to connect with you and listen to your podcast and follow you on Instagram, how can they do that? 
Yeah. So our website is thebiohackerbabes.com. We're on Instagram, thebiohacker underscore babes. Our podcast comes out every Monday. We have a new episode and we rotate between doing duo sodes. So just the two of us and then interviewing guests. So if you listen, Brittany, you'll be on soon. Yeah. You can check us out on Mondays. Awesome. I will put that in the show notes and on my website so people can find you. And thank you so much for coming on. This is great. I'm so glad we finally got to do this. Yes. yes. Thanks for having us. I know it's so great to finally meet you in person. And we just, we love what you're doing and so great to align with someone so awesome as you. Yeah. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.